Hi, my name is Jamie Lewis, and I'm joined today by Scott Wallinger to talk to you about the Appalachian Society of American Foresters history. A little over 100 years ago, a group of eight foresters who were members of the Society of American Foresters met in Asheville to discuss the situation in the Southern Appalachian Mountains region. At that meeting, those eight men drafted and sent to the national organization a request to organize what would become the Appalachian Society of American Foresters. Our talk today is not about that meeting, but about what's happened over the last century to the organization that they established. We're not going to detail every aspect of the last 100 years of this organization's proud history. Susan Yarnell and others have done that very nicely in their comprehensive book, APSAF from the beginning. We urge you to get a copy and read that. We will focus today first on how forestry within APSAF went through distinct periods that enabled forestry to progress, and then on those who led it. We'll then conclude with a few thoughts on leadership and the future of APSAF. The years 1900 through 1920 provided the initial foundation for APSAF and forestry in our region. Of the events listed on this slide for today's talk, the most important is, of course, the establishment of the Society of American Foresters in 1900. SAF's objective was, quote, to further the cause of forestry in America by fostering a spirit of comradeship among foresters, by creating opportunities for a free interchange of views upon forestry and allied subjects, and by disseminating a knowledge of the purpose and achievements of forestry. In those decades, there was no significant forestry technology and no large forest base to support forestry beyond those first national forests and state agencies. Forestry was mainly a concept in the minds of a few wealthy Northerners and a cadre of individuals educated either overseas or at, the, at a handful of American forestry schools. SAF only existed nationally for its first dozen years. From 1912 to 1920, 12 sections were established. The Journal of Forestry was the main source of technical information and professional discourse. In 1908, the Secretary of Agriculture's report estimated that 86% of the forest acreage in the Southern Appalachians had been cut over. Much was in various stages of regrowth or in young secondary forests. But according to the report, quote, practically all of it, whether cut or not, had been burned. Forestry came slowly to the South. Although a few national forests had been established by 1920, there weren't many foresters actually working in the region. Phil Wakeley, a prominent early forester, wrote that in 1924, there were fewer than 20 professionally trained foresters south of the Mason-Dixon line, and nine of them worked for the Southern and Appalachian stations. From 1920 until 1945, federal and state forestry in the South took off. This happened in part because the Clark-McNary Act of 1924 redefined what land could be purchased to turn into national forest. And it provided federal matching funds for establishing tree nurseries and firefighting efforts. The large area of national forest, state forest, and land owned by pulp and paper mills provided a land base for the first time on which forestry could be practiced. The growth in the number of national forests and research stations initially brought most of the foresters into the region. <clears throat> in 1921, the Southern Appalachian section of SAF became the 13th section overall and the first section in the South. It initially had all or parts of nine states in it. <clears throat> Sections though soon broke away and starting in 1928, its name was changed to the Appalachian section. Now the first four chairs of APSAF can be found on that petition. We've indicated them here with asterisks. John Holmes, who served as North Carolina State Forester from 1915 until 1945, 
<clears throat> was succeeded in 1923 by Vern Rhodes, the first supervisor of the Pisgah National Forest. The third chair was Earl Frothingham, serving in 1924. He was the director of the Appalachian Forest Experiment Station. <clears throat> Walter Damptoff served in 1925. He began serving as chief forester for the Champion Fire Company, or, sorry, Champion Fiber Company in Canton, North Carolina in 1920. In other words, the first leaders of APSAF came from state, federal, and private forestry, respectively. APSAF founding members began the section's tradition of service to the Parent Society immediately. To give just one example, Earl Frothingham held a position of SAF treasurer in 1921, then as a council member from 1924 to 1928, and as council member in charge of admissions in 1924 and 1925. During the years 1945 to 1975, forestry grew significantly in the South and with it APSAF. The GI Bill provided forestry education for local foresters. Paper and lumber production expanded in the post-war economy. The Association of Consulting Foresters formed in 1948. Subsequently, consulting forestry firms emerged in the APSAF states. Wildfire prevention and control intensified and prescribed burning expanded, enabling timber harvest to increase. Forest service research provided new knowledge and technology. And funding provided under the McIntyre Stennis Act for forestry research began. University forest research cooperatives emerged at NC State and Virginia Tech. In 1969, a report called The South's Third Forest was published. Its authors noted the region's forests had seen an increase of 25% more inventory since 1935, despite a huge increase in harvest levels. They expected more of the same in the coming decades, but said it will need to come from private non-industrial lands. 20 years later, a report called the South's Fourth Forest lamented that annual timber growth was declining, but that forest management techniques were succeeding. And the report offered reasons to be optimistic about the fourth forest meeting the nation's wood and timber needs. By the 1970s, mechanization with hydraulic skidders and loaders and the evolution towards tree length logging was beginning. Change had already been in the air for more than a decade. Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, published in 1962, and the reprint of Aldo Leopold's a Sand County Almanac, both published during a conservation-minded Kennedy administration, inspired a growing environmental concern that extended to forests. In the 1975 to 2000 years, APSAF continued to expand its membership with management, research, and wood procurement foresters. The breadth of its programs grew to keep up with the rapidly expanding silvicultural and harvesting technologies. APSAF leadership continued to broaden with federal, state, consulting, and industrial foresters. Environmental concerns and awareness began to appear in meeting agendas. This era brought leaps in technology, broadening environmental issues, and new technologists into forestry organizations. Pulp and paper mills were expanded new mills were built, and industry forest ownership increased. The chip and saw concept was enhancing lumber production, pine genetics and nursery technology, soil amendments, herbicide control, and new machine technology were enhancing silviculture and harvesting. However, public concerns about large-scale harvesting began to impact forestry significantly. Controversy over management of the Monongahela and Bitterroot National Forests in the early 1970s led to huge changes in national forest harvesting and management. The general public and environmentalist groups concerns resulted in state forest practice standards and the emergence of 
uh, two groups, the Sustainable Forestry Initiative and the Forest Steward, excuse me, Forest Stewardship Council. In the South, intensive pine plantation forestry was showing the ability to grow three to four cords per acre per year, triple or quadruple what foresters had accepted a few decades earlier. Many private forest owners were now practicing forestry with guidance from state and consulting foresters and from some industry foresters. Within the APSAF region, forest management was broadly accepted by the public. Although there was an undercurrent of concern or even opposition by some environmental and other citizens organizations, especially to clear cutting. In the mountains, forests were just beginning to become mature and clear cutting had not been significant there for a century. APSAF flourished with its broad public, private, and academic membership and leadership. But concerns were arising among professional foresters about the number of professionals in related fields who were playing a much more prominent role across the spectrum of public and private forestry. During this era, women were much more visible throughout the profession and subsequently in leadership of APSAF at all levels. As the new century began, large forest product companies realized they were surrounded by a huge supply of wood in highly productive forests. And corporate accounting systems penalized the economics of industrial forestry significantly. The earlier concern about inadequate wood supply that drove forestry expansion after the Second World War vanished. This led to enormous divestitures of company forests to private investors through TMOs and REITs, or real estate investment trusts. There was also a huge decline in the number of foresters employed in industrial forest management and research. Now, following passage of several environmental laws in the 1960s and 70s, here in the 1980s, or sorry, here, <clears throat> Following passage of several environmental laws in the 1960s and 70s, which triggered a change in the fields, graduates in fields such as environmental science and environmental management appeared on the staffs of conservation organizations and rose into management positions within the US Forest Service and state agencies. In some cases, the number of graduates in forestry was being eclipsed by large numbers who majored in natural resources, wildlife biology, and similar fields. Within APSAF though, the number of graduate foresters began a significant decline, even though the total number of scientific professionals working on forests did not. Much of the lumber and wood panel capacity in our region is now owned today by Canadian companies. The number of forestry jobs and their roles in forest management are evolving steadily. Forests still occupy the largest part of the land area of the three APSAF states. And there's broader public appreciation of forest, for wood, wildlife, as watersheds, for recreation, and green space. As APSAF begins its second century, it's important that we learn from history. We will now focus on two specific aspects to the first century of APSAF that emerged from our, <clears throat> from our review. APSAF is the story of a profession, and APSAF is a, a story of leadership. The Society of American Foresters is a professional society. The first century of APSAF it's the story of a profession, not a forestry club or association, a profession. What do we mean by a profession? A profession is a disciplined group of individuals who adhere to ethical standards and whose members possess special knowledge and skills and a widely recognized body of learning derived from research, education, and training at a high level. It's recognized by the public as such. 
a profession is prepared to apply this knowledge and to exercise these skills in the interest of others. Forestry has been a recognized profession in Europe since the time of the American Revolution. In the United States in the late 19th century, American foresters saw themselves as members of a new profession, and so they launched SAF. On the one hand, it formed to foster the exchange of ideas and to establish standards for the conduct of professional foresters. On the other, forming a professional organization signaled to those outside of forestry that the work mattered and that foresters would hold each other to high standards. Now it's important to distinguish between the terms profession and professional. The original professions were law, medicine, and the clergy. That expanded as more fields evolved that required a university education. Now in contrast, today there are many licensed professionals, professional electricians or hairdressers or mechanics, and yes, there are licensed forestry professionals. Now licensing and the description of a professional forester are the purview of state agencies. APSAF is the home of members of the forestry profession in our three states, and SAF defines the educational and other requirements for membership. I remember very well that in my sophomore year in forestry at NC State, Professor George Slocum walked into our silviculture class one morning and handed us all an application form for membership in SAF. You're studying to be members of the forestry profession, he said. SAF is the organization of the forestry profession. And if you're going to be a forester, you're going to be a member of SAF, period. We were studying to enter a profession and membership in the professional society was expected. Looking back on 65 years of SAF membership, Prof Slocum's admonition has served me very well. Now that attitude was pervasive throughout most of the history of APSAF. Members considered themselves members of a profession. Forrest is expected to participate in SAF, and most did actively at some level. Their employers expected them to participate in their professional society. Now, admittedly, many of their bosses were also foresters and APSAF members who were active at various levels themselves. The leadership has also been a key element of APSAF through the years. It has been led by foresters. <clears throat> in the early years, with membership numbering just in the dozens, certainly just double digits, officers often served for many years. In the 1950s, Leadership of APSAF shifted to contemporary leaders, many of whom were from forestry schools and state forestry agencies across the three states. This included a state forester and a forestry dean, as well as others at the leadership level. That continued in the 1960s with leaders from state forestry and from forest industry, including two senior forestry leaders in South Carolina. In the 1970s, SAF leadership was from three universities, forest industry, consulting forestry, and the Forestry Association. During the 1980s and 1990s, APSAF leaders came from across the spectrum of forest companies, universities, consulting forestry, state and federal forestry, and forestry associations. But foresters from universities and industry were by far the largest number, with almost half coming from universities and almost a third from forest industry. This continued in the first two decades of this century, as new names appeared in the APSAF leadership from across the spectrum of forestry sectors. Even though forest ownership was changing significantly as companies sold their forest, leaders came forward to guide APSAF in this new era. Especially noteworthy is the growing presence of women foresters and APSAF leadership in the 21st century. We hope that in the near future, we'll see more people of color in leadership and throughout the ranks of APSAF. 
our membership as a whole should better reflect the population our forests provide for. Now, history is valuable as a look backwards and as a source of lessons. But APSAF isn't just celebrating the end of its first century. We are beginning APSAF's second century. The second century doesn't depend on what was done in the past. It depends only on what we, as professional foresters, do to ensure APSAF's success in its second century. APSAF faces new challenges it must overcome, just as the founders of APSAF faced challenges a century ago. The mid-1990s introduced a major change in forester employment in the private sector as companies divested their forest. Forest products companies had large forest management and wood procurement organizations. Companies typically viewed APSAF participation as a part of personal and leadership development while making professional contacts. In contrast, TMOs are more compact businesses with fewer employees. Much on the ground management of their forest is contracted to consulting forestry firms that also have fewer foresters. Forestry schools have had declining enrollment as more students opt to study natural resources management, wildlife biology, and other related specialties. <clears throat> Many senior forest management positions and agencies today are not held by foresters, but by graduates from allied fields of study who associate with their respective professional societies. And too many forestry graduates choose not to belong to SAF for often unknown reasons. SAF has taken steps to address this nationally with its national strategic plan and related process. And APSAF has launched a parallel initiative those in related activities are setting the stage for SAF and APSAF's second century. But as the slide says, where there are challenges, there are opportunities. So in closing, we reflect on two key elements, forestry and SAF as a profession, the role of leadership and differentiation of SAF from other organizations. With these three specific questions, To those of you who are forestry faculty members, we ask, <clears throat> do you create a strong sense in your forestry students that they are preparing to enter a profession? Do you create an expectation that your students will become members of SAF and participate in it throughout their careers? Do, you, do your faculty forestry colleagues create that same expectation? Do your student SAF chapters include all your forestry students? And do they have programs or do your programs encourage professionalism and leadership in these programs and activities? To those of you who hire foresters, we ask, do you create an expectation that as members of a profession, they will belong to and will participate in the Society of American Foresters? Do you provide them the time and opportunities to do that? To all of us in APSAF, we ask, what more does APSAF need to do to differentiate itself from the more broadly based forestry associations and other forest related organizations and to create compelling value for its members? What active role should APSAF play as a profession in forest policy? What does APSAF need to provide to its members to enhance and sustain their professional knowledge and skills? What does APSAF need to do to provide its members a broad contemporary perspective on forestry related topics and concerns? How can APSAF provide a greater social exchange among forestry professionals? In short, how can APSAF maximize the value of SAF membership to all of the foresters in the three states. APSAF as the regional organization of the profession and its leadership drove the growth and success of APSAF during its first century. APSAF's second century will only mirror the success of the first century 
If foresters today continue to view APSAF as the place where all foresters are members, the challenge and the opportunity for APSAF and for SAF nationally will be to remain in the forefront of all aspects of forestry leadership and forest management. And that depends on each of you and your relationship with SAF. On behalf of Scott Wallinger, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. And we hope that you take to heart what we have said about stepping up as members and moving into leadership positions. Thank you very much.